ഒരു ഇൻഫ്ലുവൻസ് ഓക്കെ ലെറ്റ് സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ലെറ്റ് സ്റ്റാർട്ട് അവർ ഓവർ വ്യൂ ഓഫ് പ്രോജക്ട് മാനേജ്മെന്റ് പ്രോസസ്സസ് the first process is develop project charter what is develop project charter what is the result of this process is project charter very good so what are we thinking in this process <clears throat> what are we doing in this process i explain to you what is project charter that's why i'm asking you the question huh eh? giving the okay uh, approval of uh, project commencement you mean okay basically we are trying to define the project at high level we are trying to define the project at high level so you are selected as a project manager for the sponsor what will you do first you will develop the project charter by working with the key stakeholders they will give you the high level information about the project then you are coming up with a project charter what is the information contained there <coughs> objectives of the project high level requirements of the key stakeholders what are the key deliverables expected in this project <coughs> what all the uh, yeah very high level scope is they will only talk about the key requirements <clears throat> what are the assumptions and constraints they consider in initiating this project what is the timeline <clears throat> the stakeholders are expecting us to complete the project <clears throat> what is the budget they are ready to spend so you have a high level estimate this project will cost between 300 to 600 million that are a high level estimate also milestone schedule what are the key milestones of this project so they put the milestone schedule in the project charter hmm hmm what are all the risk they could see while they initiating the project which is called initial risk or high level risk <clears throat> and then they will also talk about who are the key stakeholders of this project what is the level of participation expected what kind of influence they may exert on the project and then who is the project manager for this project what is his authority level we are getting the authority from the project charter and then you have the key stakeholders and sponsors signing the project charter in order to gain the commitment of the key stakeholders for executing the project <clears throat> what i have told you here we are trying to define the project high level by documenting the key information about the project so that key stakeholders will have a clear understanding of what is this project about what are they trying to achieve what is the benefit to the organization they can able to understand and then by signing the project charter they are giving the commitment for executing the project why we need to do that if the key stakeholders commitment is not available at this stage they keep changing their mind they may change during the planning they may change during execution they may even try to change the project at the end of the almost like end of the project then it is going to ruin the whole project even with this exercise do you think they are going not going to change change will happen but it is minimal so we can able to manage it within the plans that's what we are trying to achieve through the development of project charter by defining the project at high level that's our first step yeah mostly at this stage who will be there client organization people project manager project management team design consultants may be available at this stage no it will not be at this stage contractor will not be available 
ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜರ್ ಕ್ಲೈಂಟ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸೇಷನಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಅಪ್ ನಾವ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಡಿಫೈನಿಂಗ್ ದ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಜನರಲಿ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಲೈಂಟ್ ಸೈಡ್ ಪಿ ಎಂ ಸಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಡಿಸೈನ್ ಕನ್ಸಲ್ಟೆಂಟ್ಸ್ will be involved at this stage mm. Mm. <clears throat> so when you when you are appointed as a project manager the first step you need to sit with the key stakeholders understand their requirements at a level they always have a statement they call it statement of work they give you the statement of work this is what we are expecting in this project so those information help us in defining the project at high level that's why i told you most of you not involved in the initiation of the project unless you have experience in working with the clients or project management consultants or design consultants you may have a chance of having the project initiation otherwise most of the time either you are entering during the execution stage or you are entering in the planning stage this is our experience in the industry so the result is project chart right very good the second process in the initiation is identify stakeholders identify stakeholders what do you mean identify stakeholders this name tells me that i don't know anybody uh, in the project i don't know any stakeholders ha huh? correct right. that we need to analyze that we need to analyze but firstly we need to identify all the stakeholders as feasible at this stage but we already know who are the key stakeholders of the project where we documented in the project charter so when you are sitting with these stakeholders we can able to identify the other stakeholders right say for example i'm sitting with the client organizational people the key members are documented there so i'm talking to them you may say it's not only me as a stakeholder in this project we have uh, in our organization construction department engineering department design department sales department accounting department financing department there are multi discipline departments available and these managers will be also the stakeholders in the project they may be able to expand this list no organization chart is different organization chart we are looking at the uh, who are the team members and uh, what is the reporting relationship between the team members we are structuring in the organization chart which is developed under resource management area the here we are listing out who are the stakeholders of the project here as i told you we have the tendency what is our tendency if we take care of the sponsor and client requirements we will be all right which is not correct we need to take care all the stakeholders requirement we spoke about who are the stakeholders also also they are stakeholders hmm mm. mma civil defense uh, mmi all are stakeholders they are not going to be involved on day to day but they will ensure that you are implementing the regulations right so they are external stakeholders basically mm. no it could be individual it could be organization both <coughs> say for example client organization you just say simply say client organization no there are multi members key members will be involved in the project participate in the project they are going to contribute Mm. correct okay within the same organization all are having same uh, level of contribution some are experts subject matter experts some are only managers so they have the high influence they have the power so we have to deal with them differently differently right I 
But at this stage, you may not be able to identify such a level of detail. At this stage, you may be able to identify detailed information about the client team. Yes, you may do it. Uh, but here at this stage, you may identify, I need um, interior design consultant. I need safety, design, safety consultant. I need fire safety consultant. That kind of identification can be done at this stage. Then when we go through the planning work, we continue to identify. Mm. At person, yes. Yes. It could be a person, it could be a department, it could be a, a discipline which involve at that level of we need interior design consultant office for yeah, this project. So they are going to be a stakeholder letter, right? So what we are trying to do is we are trying to identify all the stakeholders as feasible. I cannot say you will be able to identify 100% of the stakeholders at this stage. By name, by position, you may not. But you could identify by company or the nature of work involved, like interior design, fire safety consultant, uh, security consultant, and so on. Right? That's what we can do at this stage. <clears throat> but why we need to identify all of them? Why we need to put effort? Because when we move to the planning, you are going to collect the detailed requirement from the stakeholders. So you must have a good idea of who are the stakeholders so that we can be able to collect the detailed requirements from the stakeholders later, right? What are we identifying? Who is the stakeholder? Which organization he may come from? What is the role he may play in the project? What kind of contribution he may have in the project? Some stakeholder may provide financial contribution. Some stakeholder may provide subject matter contribution like export. Some are resources contribution, right? Some are equipment, some are human resources. Yeah. Supplier, supplier, local supplier, international supplier, all possible suppliers. You may not by company name, you may not have it now. But we need supply for concrete, a supplier for concrete, supplier for timber, supplier for this. So but due to the nature of work involved, we may identify. No. But the identification of the Yes. So that we can consider. Uh, later when we go into the planning, we will call these stakeholders to collect the requirements, come up with a plan. Those two, they will contribute. So, we are identifying who is the stakeholder, which organization is coming from, what is the role he may play in the project, what kind of influence they may expert, what are the key requirements of the stakeholder, what are the expectations of the stakeholder, whether the stakeholder is a supporter to the project, a resistor to the project, a neutral to the project. What kind of knowledge, skills, experience, expertise they have? All these informations are collected and documented into the result of this process is stakeholder register. What is the result? Stakeholder register, where we are documenting all the collected information. So that when we go to the planning, we may be able to collect the detailed requirements from them. Secondly, when we go to the strategy development for managing the stakeholders under planned stakeholder engagement, we will be able to come up with a right strategy of managing the stakeholders' expectations throughout the project life cycle. Right? That's why we are trying to put effort on identifying all the stakeholders as feasible at this stage. These two are done as part of the process. What else we do in the initiation? Yes. Mm. 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 Reference drawings. Okay.
no in the planning stage which is in project management it's called planning but in actual practice it's called planning and designing phase planning and designing phase it's a technical work so they won't bring into this it is a technical work yeah. so when we are doing that we call it as planning phase right actually it is called planning and designing phase are they in the industry Mm. Yeah. In the initiation, even you don't have the concept. You will have only clan brief. Only your requirement, high level requirement. That's all you want. And the concept design is starting after the initiation, sign of the project charter. Then they will award the designer and then they will start doing the concept design. At the same time, we are also looking at the based on the detailed requirements we are collecting. Even before you do concept design, they must have the detailed requirements. So they are going to be involved with you in collecting the detailed requirement. Who is going to be there? Generally, project manager, design consultant, and the client's team will have the in the detailed requirement collection. Yeah. Uh, that is before the project charter. Uh, the business case is input for the development of the project charter. It gives you the information with respect to the business standpoint. Why they are spending 300 million? What they want to achieve in the organization? They also do the cost benefit analysis. And it's all part of the business case. Also, they develop the benefit management plan. What is the benefit we are going to achieve by doing this project? When we can able to achieve this benefit, is it possible to achieve within the life cycle of the project? or it may take a couple of years to realize the benefit intended from this project can be documented within the benefit management plan, they think, mm. before initiation. Yes. It's part of the feasibility studies and uh, business case development. Huh? Business case development. Mm. Before we de take decision on the project go decision by issuing, we are taking the project go decision by issuing the project charter basically. Before that, it's all ideas only. Mm. Mm. So what happened is, <clears throat> mostly the business case development, benefit management plan, these are part of the organization work where generally management team in the company, they perform this, okay? They may engage the consultant to do the feasibility studies, all this, they may do it, including financial analysis and our uh, internal rate of return, all this analysis, they may do it. And then it comes to this stage to initiate the project. So when they are coming to this stage, we define the project based on those information at high level and then get these stakeholders agree and sign off. Finally, sponsors approve the project. That's the way it happens. Nowadays, actually, what happens is the stakeholders' expectations are getting bigger and bigger on project manager. Now, even nowadays, they're expecting you to involve in the business case development. They are now the stakeholders' expectation is like that. That is the latest trend in the industry. Previously, we started with the project managers appointed before start of the plan. Then they move to the initiation. Now the trend is they are expecting the project manager to be employed before even during the development of business case now. That is the expectations of that. In the project charter. Oh. No, yes, but they want you to involve there, develop the business case. So working with the stakeholders, working with the stakeholders, why they do that? Now they realize there is a benefit by engaging the project manager so that he can facilitate the stakeholders within the organization in a structured manner to come up with a good business case to justify the project. That's what the expectation now. Nothing else. So they see the value in it. That's why the trend is changing. Apart from these two, in the initiation processes, we also need to collect 
all our organizational policies, procedures, templates, the processes we normally adopt in doing the project, which is existing policies, all being collected and keep it for our ready reference. This is all part of the initiation activity. Yeah? Ah, organizational process as such. Plus, you may look at the company database, whether they have done any similar kind of projects in the past. They collect all these project records. Mm. As a part of the organization process, as such. As such only. Yeah? Lessons learned. Lessons learned is there. All our project records is there. Yeah, enter no. It's a part of the organizational process as such. Mm. It's part of the organizational process as such. All this being collected and keep it ready for our reference. This is all done in the initiation stage. Any doubt? I know what is the why you are asking such a question. We are, we are not involved in that initiation. That's why you are having such a question. No harm. Okay. You can ask you free to ask any question because I know what is your level of involvement. So that's why I'm trying to explain to you to in a way you will understand what is the meaning of initiation, how it is being done. So we are ready for moving to the planning now. Boy hmm. is going out, coming back. Huh? Yeah. You want the template, you mean? Yeah. Yes, yes. Available. It's already part of the presentation. It's already there. Hmm. Second, let's go to the planning. You know what is planning now, right? We are trying to develop a strategy and approach in managing the managing this project. Not managing other projects. Huh? We are managing this project. The project assigned to you. The first process over there is develop project management plan. Develop project management plan. Good. What is the result of this process? Project management plan. What is project management plan? Which is basically a, a compilation of all the plans we creating through the planning processes which is scope management plan, schedule management plan, cost management plan, quality management plan, resource management plan, communications management plan, risk management plan, procurement management plan, stakeholder engagement plan, scope based plan, schedule based plan, cost based plan, performance management based plan. All these final plans are pulled and called as project management plan, which is our comprehensive plan of action for managing this project. So now we are just starting the planning work. How can we get project management plan? Not possible, right? Yes, you can get the project management plan upon completion of all the planning processes. When you finalize all the plans, you pull all the plans compiled as project management plan. So in this case, what will you do when you are starting this process? That's my question. Now, what is the level of information available about the project now with you? Project charter, high level information. By going through the high level information, what you can understand? You can understand the nature of the project, size of the project, complexity of the project, what are the various constraints we may face in doing this project, all this available. With this information, what you can do? You can think of how can I manage this project? What is the strategy for managing this project? That's what you can think as a first step. So basically what are you thinking here is in this first step, by understanding the nature, size and complexity of the project, you are trying to come up with a mind mapping of what all the processes from planning process group I may utilize. What all the tools and techniques I may use. What all the processes from executing processes I may utilize? What all the tools and techniques I may use it? What all the processes from monitoring control processes I may utilize? Why you have 49 processes? Are you going to use all the 49 processes for all size of project, all nature of project, all level of complexity? No. 
so we are the one need to decide what all the processes from each process group we need to utilize that is in the first step in the management plan so we are basically mind mapping ourselves how to manage the project by utilizing the project management processes yeah creating a snow best plan best plan is final plan you are thinking how to manage as a first level of thinking high level information about the project including timeline expectation budget expectation risk you could face constraint you could face high level key deliverables expected from the project all of that mm, very good day. very good call very good question if you know what all the various estimating techniques available you will not ask this question <laughs> estimating techniques say for example i did a villa last year so i completed a villa 10000 square meter i spent 10 million okay complete handed over another neighbor client come to me hello ravi i want to develop a similar villa but my area is 20000 square meter can you tell me how much cost or how much budget what is the timeline expected to complete can you tell me you just he asking me like this okay i have only 20000 square meter well i want to build i don't know any other detail what i will tell you sorry sir please give me the project let me appoint the designer let me do the concept design schematic design detail design i do the detail planning i will come up with a duration project schedule i will come up with a detailed estimation of costing and then i will tell you sir how much this project will cost this is what you are going to tell them so you know in the past project you have the data how much you spent based on that you may come up with a one square one square meter 2000 qatar real so 20000 square meter it will cost you this much right so that level of estimation is done in the initiation stage mm. 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 we must use the industry standards many time maybe it's not in this region maybe other region this project has already been done so you can able to collect that data mm. Mm. we have a lot of experts cost tax management experts are there we can discuss with the cost consultant to come up with a high level estimate huh mm. Many thumb rules are there. Okay, this all initial idea only. I may say 300 to 600 million. You think it is going to cost 300 to 600 million? Maybe no. When we do the detailed estimation, this range will reduce. Right? We will talk about that later. So, the first step in the planning work in this process is we need to adopt tailoring concept. We need to adopt tailoring concept by understanding the size nature and complexity of the project we are selecting the appropriate processes from each process group then we need to determine the tools of techniques we may utilize we need to determine the level of implementation rigorous of implementation interaction required between the various processes in order to achieve the objectives of the project. That's all we can think at this stage. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Say, for example, you are doing an internal project where you don't have procurement. You don't need any external support. In this case, you don't need procurement. Okay? So that's why we are thinking. It may be a first initial thought only. Of course, when you do the detailed planning, and then when we complete all the plan, we may go multiple revisions. So we will be able to capture up even when we are making some wrong assumptions in the previous processes. When we do the iteration, we will be able to correct it. We will be able to refine it before we finalize the plan. A lot of work to do. <laughs> it's a big work. Yes. Okay. It, because in each and every step of planning work, we are making assumptions. We are considering various constraints. We are considering different situations we may face life cycle of the project. Accordingly, you are coming up with a plan. When we move further, when you get better understanding of the project, you may refine the previous documents. Thereby, it's getting workable, achievable, realistic. That's what I told you. Hmm. We are only having high level reformation. That's all we can do as a first step in this process. Why we need to do that? Because as a project manager, we need to think big first and then we go into detail. You don't think straight away, jump into process, you will start. So we need to think, strategize, mind map what we are going to do, what process utilize, what techniques use, what level of interaction required between the processes, we decide and then we move on to the next step. That's the first. That's called tailoring concept. What is tailoring concept? Project manager and his team has to select the appropriate processes from each process group. Need to determine the tools and techniques they are going to apply, the level of implementation, the rigorous of implementation, and the dependencies and interaction required between the processes has to be tailor made to suit a specific project. Now, this tailor made is not going to apply for all the projects. This is for this specific project only. That's called tailoring concept. So you have to tailor. Right? So shirt is available for my size always. I have to tailor it for my size. Same thing you are going to do for the project. Okay. That's all we can do with this process. We stop. We move to the other processes. When we finish all the planning processes, then we'll come back to this process finally. And then we pull all the final plans and call it as project management. That's all. Okay. Second process, plan scope management. Plan scope management. <clears throat> what is my plan scope? What is the result of this process? Scope management plan. Scope management. What is scope management plan? Basically, here you are thinking about what is your strategy and approach in managing the scope of the project? What is your strategy and approach in managing the scope of the project? When I say strategy for managing the scope of the project, where I'm thinking about how I'm going to plan, how I'm going to execute, how I'm going to measure the performance, how I'm going to manage the variances. If the variances are minor in nature, what I will do? When the variances are major in nature, what I will do? How I'm going to get the acceptance of the completed deliverable from the stakeholders? How I'm going to close the project? I'm thinking about all aspects, planning, execution, control, and closure. So I will have a complete strategy of managing the scope throughout the project life cycle. Always remember, whatever you want to do, think first, Strategize, select the processes, how you are going to think it, select the techniques, and then you move. If you don't have the strategy, you straight away jump into process, you are going to start. That's why in the project management, they always set for you the first process is development of management plan. Plan scope management, scope management plan. Plan schedule management, schedule management plan. Plan cost management, cost management plan. Plan quality management, quality management plan. Plan resource management, resource management plan. Plan communications management, communications management plan. Plan risk management, risk management plan. Plan procurement management, procurement management plan. 
plan, stakeholder engagement, stakeholder engagement plan. So every knowledge area, your first work is strategize yourself. How are you going to manage that particular knowledge area? Mm. That's, that's, that's coming to that point. Right? Yes, inside this plan, yes. So I'm thinking about I'm going to plan, execute, control, close up, right? In each knowledge area, how I'm going to do that, I'm starting this. What does that mean? Say, let's take scope management plan. Firstly, I'm thinking about how I'm going to plan first. Why? I don't have much information about the project. Are you able to think about execution control now? No. So your first step in the management plan is you only think about how are you going to plan. That's all you can think. When you complete your planning work, you will come back to this process again. You will think about execution control when you get better understanding of the project, but not at this stage. So the develop management plans development is happening in two stages. One is first thinking about how are you going to plan. When you complete the planning work, when we get the better understanding of the project, then we will think about how are you going to execute, how are you going to control, how are you going to close. So it is a two-stage development. This is second part. So what is the meaning of how are you going to plan? We have the processes for planning. How are you going to perform these processes? So I am thinking about how are you going to collect the requirements? What are the tools and techniques you may utilize? How are you going to define the scope of the project? What are the tools and techniques you may utilize? How are you going to create the WBS? What are the tools and techniques you may utilize? You are documenting in the management plan. That's all. So you are basically thinking about how you are going to perform these processes and what are all the tools and techniques you may use? What is the result of each process? That's what you're thinking and documenting. So you have a clear strategy in performing the planning. So you will be able to flow through these processes smoothly. For example, you didn't do the scope management plan. You straight away jump into collect requirements process. You call the stakeholders, conducted the meeting with them. You're trying to collect requirements from them. One of the deliverable, yes, there are five people involved. So you call them in a meeting room, you discuss with them, you ask them the question. Sometime you ask them the prepared question, they respond. And then sometime you have, based on their response, you also ask spontaneous questions, they respond, and then note it out, and then you write it up properly, and then review with them, and you can finalize the requirements. There are one deliverable, there are 50 stakeholders involved. There are 50 stakeholders involved. How you are going to conduct meeting with them, 50 stakeholders? Are you going to break them into 10, 10, 10, conduct uh, for 10 meetings? And then again, you call for a meeting by taking a big conference hall in the hotel. And then you conduct the workshop to collect the requirement? No. It has a different thing. If you have more number of stakeholders, it has a different technique. We cannot use the same meeting technique for this. That's why we want you to think and strategize, document what techniques you are going to use so that we can able to flow through these processes smoothly. Otherwise, you will stuck them. Clear? Question and reason survey. That's the technique name. Question and reason survey. Question and reason survey. So I will, I will send the standard questionnaire to them to understand what is the requirement. I will send it to all the stakeholders. I will give them one week time, attend this time, and then they need to submit their response. And then I will use the key members to sit down, analyze, and then we finalize the requirements. When you have more audience, like how, how is the economic statistics done? How is the population statistics done? Are you going to see every member, every group of members? Right? You may take 20 to 30 years, how many number, not to say 1 million population. You may take 50,000 people for collecting the data. Right? Like that you will do. That's the same techniques. We'll talk about it when we go into the process. Yeah. Hmm. 
which one ah. ah, that is i show you to develop the strategy for managing the stakeholders power interest grid i show you in the class right that we will use it in the planned stakeholder engagement process i gave i explained to you to understand what is the importance of the stakeholder management at initial stages that's why i explained that but that is being used in the planned stakeholder engagement process to come up with the strategy for managing the stakeholders throughout the project life cycle. <clears throat> so clear, is it clear with the management plan? So it's a good concept. We want you to think, strategize before you jump into processes. Okay. The next, yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. In the standard, the first three chapters talks about general frame, framework of project management, basic understanding of project management industry, which is the last three of us we spoke about, the first three chapters. Fourth chapter, they start with the integration management. So they use the chapter number to map the process name. So that's why I say 4.1, 4.2, integration. Five is scope management area. So 5.1, 5.2. <clears throat> now let's talk about collect requirements. What do you mean by collect requirements? I don't have any requirements in my hand, so I want to collect the requirements, right? Is what it gives me the impression. But we already have the requirements. What do we have? High level requirement. Is it good enough for you to come up with a detailed plan? No. It only helps you in understanding the key stakeholder requirement or understanding the project. But that will not help us in developing the detailed plans. So we need detailed requirements. We need detailed requirements in a well-quantified manner so that we can be able to create the plans for achieving the requirements. In fact, all the plans you are creating here is for meeting the requirements of the stakeholder, not for showing I know how to do the plan, no. Why we are creating this plan? To meet the requirements collected from the stakeholder, right? So here, what I mean by collect requirements, we are collecting the detailed requirements from the stakeholders. What are the requirements you need to collect? From the stakeholders. Yes, yes. They have only gave you the high level requirements before. Now they have to sit down and define everything what they want. Also, they, they will use this information to do the design development. That also ah, yes. They are coming up with the drawings and that. Based on this only, they can able to develop. Hmm. Okay, they can develop the concept design based on the high level requirement itself. But the schematic design, they may not be able to do it unless you have these requirements, right? Deliverables all, we will describe in the next step. In the scope of work, we describe the deliverables. So what, do you have, what are all the requirements we need to collect? Firstly, we need to understand what is the product they're looking for, huh? Product requirements. So they need to define the, say, size, shape, functionality, performance, they need to define. They need to define their product first. Oh. Yes, sir. That's we call it as requirements. Based on this, the specification will be developed later as technical, part of the technical, which integrates these requirements, including the standards, methodology, technology, installation details, everything will be included in this specification, which is prepared as part of the tender and as part of the procurement study okay to call the stakeholders to code for the product right so here we are first step we are trying to understand what is their requirement so they need to define the product first so defining the features and functions of the product is by the stakeholder which is product requirements then we need to also understand 
what all the technology methodology processes procedures standards we are going to use in creating this product which is called the project requirements technical requirements verification requirements test requirements acceptance requirements maintenance requirements you can keep expanding business requirements functional requirements for performance requirements and keep expanding this way including maintenance requirements right so basically what we are trying to do we are trying to collect the requirements from different stakeholders it's not that all this requirement is going to be defined by a single stakeholder some stakeholders are involved in <laughs> defining the product <laughs> some are responsible for defining the functionality some are responsible for defining the performance some are responsible for defining the standards methodology technology we need to utilize like a design consultant they will involve in this exercise right some are responsible for defining the quality requirements some are responsible for defining the test requirements verification requirements acceptance requirements maintenance requirements so there are multi stakeholders involved in defining the detailed requirements for a project so basically the result of this process is requirements documentation requirements documentation we are documenting their requirements in detail in a well quantified manner hmm. this next step that's the next step is scope this is only requirements we cannot call this as a scope ah to make the scope yes this is the basis yeah this is the basis correct correct based on this we are going to develop the scope this is the next step so this is the first result second result from this process is called requirements traceability matrix this is a second result requirement traceability matrix what is that here in defining this detailed requirement there are multi stakeholders involved some are defining responsible for defining the product some are standards but some are technology some are, so there are multi stakeholders involved. how we are going to keep track of all these requirements and the stakeholders why we need to keep track them you have a responsibility what is your responsibility upon collection of the requirement you need to come up with a plan for meeting these requirements so you need to manage the stakeholders through this exercise during execution you need to make sure all this deliver all these requirements are achieved and deliverables are produced during monitoring control we need to see whether our performance matches with the plan in achieving the requirements of the stakeholders until you close the project where you demonstrate that you have achieved the requirements of the stakeholders we have met the objectives of the project we met the success criteria until then you have a responsibility to manage these requirements until the acceptance in the closing we have the responsibility how we are going to for example you are not creating a requirement traceability matrix assuming this way you collect all the requirements then you came up with your scope complete all the plans and then you move to the execution you are executing the work mm. no then you are executing the work you are producing the deliverable <clears throat> when you are producing the deliverable what happen is you are facing a problem you are not able to achieve this deliverable by meeting all the requirements defined due to methodology problem or technology problem how will you resolve it definitely we will sit down and cry right <laughs> no we are going to sit with the team understanding why we are not able to achieve this requirement what all the various reason behind this problem we may come up with a possible solutions to address this problem and so on we will do that but remember you cannot able to take decision until you involve the stakeholder 
who have provided you requirements related to this deliverable. So how will you find the stakeholders? Who are the stakeholders involved in this deliverable? So you have to go back to the planning document. He dig down all the workshop we conducted, go through the meeting minutes, find out who are the stakeholders who are involved in providing the requirements related to the deliverable. And then you bring them into the meeting, discuss, come up with a solution. By this time, your problem already bigger. Is it possible? That's why when we are collecting the requirements itself, we are organizing the requirements and the related stakeholders documented into the requirement traceability matrix. What is the requirement? Description of the requirement. Who are the stakeholders involved? Which organization he came from? Where is he located? Whether these requirements related to the product objective or cost objective, or schedule objective or quality objective, all this can be documented. Sometime during the life cycle, the stakeholders may propose changes. Some of these requirements has been modified. So we can be able to update it. All these requirements are modified, added, are approved under integrated change control. All this can be keep updating into the requirement traceability matrix. So you have a clear mechanism in your hand in managing the requirements throughout the project, managing the requirements and the stakeholders throughout the project life cycle. That's what you are trying to achieve through this result, requirement traceability matrix, which makes your life easier in managing the requirement. That's all. Clear? Why is correction always going out, coming back? Okay. The next is defined scope. What do you remember defined scope? Now, you are all some way involved in managing the scope of work in the project. Definitely, you are using the scope of work every day. Just can you recall from your mind and tell me, what is the structure of the scope of work? What are the key elements defined within the scope of work? Just recall and tell me. Mm. 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 Payments may not talk about in the scope of work. That's part of the contract. Yeah. That's part of the agreement. That is in the contract agreement, payment, payment terms, all these things. It will be part of the agreement. Yeah, if you read any scope of work, this is the standard structure. It starts with the executive summary of the scope of work. They will discuss the scope of work at a high level first. And then they talk about product. And then they talk about methodology, technology, standards, technical aspects. And then they talk about quality. And they talk about testing aspect, what all the tests to be performed. And then they talk about verification or acceptance aspects, acceptance criteria will be there. And then they talk about maintenance aspects. Yeah? Then finally, you can see one statement. Project exclusions. Project exclusions. So what you are trying to do? You are trying to define the scope of work in an integrated manner. In such a way, what is included in this project? What is not included in this project? That's what you are trying to. So scope means it is a detailed discussion of the product and the project work. Meaning, Details of the product and the methodology, technology standard we are going to use in creating the product. Both are integrated and described well. By clearly to understand what is included in this project, what is not included. We can do a lot of things. Do you think everything we are going to do available in the market? No. The stakeholder is the one defined you what they want. That's why we are integrating the requirements in a very descriptive way by integrating the product and project requirement in an integrated manner to define the project, what is included, what is not included. If the scope of work is not clear, what will happen? Suppose scope of work is not clear. Yeah. 
end of the day, based on that, you can create the deliverable. When they come for verification, no, this is not I wanted. This is what I, I not expected. Yeah? Then you will end up all the waste of resources, time, cost, everything waste. That's why our focus in this process is we want to make sure clearly defining the scope in such a way what is included, what is not included. And the stakeholders must review and sign off. Yes. Uh, uh. So where is the detail now? <laughs> this is a protection strategy. <laughs> uh, don't come back and tell me you didn't give me detail. No, it's not. Because you have the details. All the specifications are there. Contract agreement. So they're referring to multiple documents to say that way. So they give the outline. Uh, okay. Refer to all these documents. You need to implement this. That's what they are saying that way. <clears throat> but... It cannot be done when I do the as a project manager, when I create the scope of work before tender. Can I say this? I give you only outline, you decide it. Then your cost will not be 300, 600 million. <laughs> so our first step always, collect the detailed requirements, finalize the scope. We are trying to finalize the scope here. <coughs> Yeah, okay, you need to define key deliverable. Fine, but you also need to say what are the items you are not expecting in this project. Then only the scope will be clear. You only say, I am I'm only expecting this. No, it is there. It's all there. It is all there. You need to apply these standards. You need to apply this methodology. They may give you ideas. Okay, they will give you that. You need to follow that. That's why they are in the construction industry, it is complex compared to other industry. Because here we are using that's called detailed design based statement of work. It's called design based statement of work. We need to give them every detail, including methodology, technology, standard, procedure, how it is to be installed, how it is to be tested, how it is to be measured, how it is to be proved, it is completed successfully. Everything we are giving them in detail. Basically, what we are telling them, take this, go and build as it is, right? That level of detail we are providing in the construction. Hmm. Methodology? Method statement. No, that is developed during the plan quality management process. Inspection, test plan, method statements, all part of the quality management plan. Hmm. No, no need, no need. When you see scope of work, even though they describe the requirements and the integrated manner, uh, requirements of the product and the methodology, technology, what do you need to do, they are integrating. But they also say what all the key deliverables expected also, they will also specify that. But that is only give you the idea. But we need to develop WBS, where you can able to demonstrate all the deliverables from this scope of work. That's the next step. Is it clear? When I, what do you mean by defined scope? Here, the result of this process is ah, yeah. Plan, plan, planning. This statement is part of the planning work. Quality management plan. Part of the quality management plan. Inspection, test plans, method statements, right? all this part of the quality management plan development. You may do it differently slightly. Maybe maybe you do that. Only the inspector and test plans at the planning stage. Maybe before the execution starts, 
you prepare the method statement, submit to them, get it approved. It's all part of the quality management efforts. Hmm? Which approval? Oh, yeah, part of the quality management. Quality assurance. That's part of the quality assurance activity. Hmm. Hmm. Monitoring control. Quality control is in the execution stage. But uh, all these materials, submittals, drawing, shop drawing, submittals, all in the execution stage only. But it's part of the quality assurance. In this information. Only in the quality control, we're verifying whether the deliverable completed correctly. We are verifying the deliverable in the quality control. Not the verifying the method statements or shop drawing or material submitter. Already we produce the deliverable. We are verifying through the quality control. See whether this deliverable has been completed correctly. Monitoring control. Monitoring control activity. Now, so what is the result of this process? Define scope. Project scope statement. What is the result? Project scope statement. Meaning, which is, we call it a scope of work. But the project management terminology is project scope statement. But when I use the terminology project scope statement in this process, which gives me two important messages. Yeah, go ahead. Here, information requirement. Where where you ask this kind of information? Where, where what stage you will ask for this EAR? Uh, four Uh, that's called a statement of work. Generally, the terminology is statement of this high level information again. Now, that will be part of the tender. EIR is part of the tender. Selecting the sellers. For selecting the sellers, it is part of the tender. That will generally, you have two stages from you are getting from this kind of information. First stage in the initiation, which is called a client statement of work. Okay, they call it a statement of work or uh, what do you call key stakeholders requirement, very high level only. Then, using that information, you are developing the project charter. And then you are sitting with them, you collecting the detailed requirements, you finalizing the scope. When you go for a tender, we need to make sure the sellers are having good understanding about the project. So, we give the Precise information about the project under statement where it is part of the tender. It gives you the procurement items in a clear and concise term so that the stakeholders can clearly understand or sellers can understand what they are expected to perform in the project. I will talk about this when I go to the procurement. There are different methodology of procurement has a different level of details we need to describe. Yeah. Now come to the point now where we are discussing about project scope statement. Right? When I use the terminology project scope statement, it gives me two important message. It gives me two important message in the project. Number one, it gives me the indication that I have the final scope of work in my hand. I have the final scope of work signed up by the stakeholders is in my hand. That's what is the first indication. What's the second message? That means we are ready to start the planning work. That means we are ready to start the planning work. So our real planning work only starts upon completion of the defense scope process where we finalize the scope of work and get the sign up. Yes, this is what we want. Suppose you are not doing this, you, you didn't finalize the scope of work. You can develop, definitely can develop the plan, but no plans can get finalized. Why? The scope itself is not finalized. If they change the scope, you need to redo the planning again. That's why our focus in the project management is 
we want to finalize the scope with the stakeholders in the defined process they must sign up yes this is what we want then upon completion of the plans in case the stakeholders may asking for changes to the scope of work we will handle them under perform integrated change control process which is part of the change management strategy we need to handle it but we cannot say you cannot ask for change <laughs> you don't have the authority to do that we need to find a way of accommodating we will talk about it there so clear defined scope is clear for you the next is create wbs what is create wbs work breakdown study what does that mean hmm you are defining the scope very sequence I give you a simple example to understand this when I finish my defined scope process as a project manager my table is full what is there our detailed requirement collected documents are there architectural volume mechanical volume electrical volume and so on right and our scope of work architectural scope of work mechanical scope of work electrical scope of work multi volume is there my table is basically full so what is my next i need to develop plans to achieve this scope of work right i need to develop the plans for achieving this scope of work so if i take each volume of documents read through highlight and come up with a plan when i will finish it is it possible so in order to make our life easier but also by reading through this when you are going to understand the project you must understand the project first before you develop the plan how are you going to understand so what we are trying to do is we are trying why we have to keep all this information into detail and try to come up with a plan don't do that why not we break down this scope of work into the deliverables we are going to create from this scope of work <coughs> so you are breaking down the scope into the deliverables you are going to produce let's take a building project example i have the building process scope of work i need to come up with a wbs so i may break down the entire project into substructure which is below ground superstructure above ground architectural work mechanical work electrical work infrastructure work and so on it's still bigger right? so i break the say substructure still bigger for me i break down into basement 1 basement 2 basement 3 i may break down into foundation work so four item When I say foundation, because maybe architectural work, mechanical work, electrical work, until I reach to the point where the deliverable is smaller in size. When the deliverable is smaller in size, easy for me to plan, execute, control, and deliver to the stakeholders. So you are breaking down the scope of work into deliverables from the higher order. until he reach to the point the deliverable is smaller in size the lowest level in the wbs is called work package what is that called work package which is the smallest size there is advantage instead of going through this multi volume of scope of work if you look at this deliverables we are going to produce the team will say sir these are the deliverables we are going to produce no problem sir we have produced such a deliverables it makes them to understand the project better we can able to visualize the entire project 
we can visualize the whole natural deliverables we are going to produce from this scope of works. So number one, we are getting better understanding. We are visualizing the whole project. The team is getting better understanding of the scope of work. Timeline for? No, not at this stage of thinking. That's how we are developing so our schedule process. We will think about it. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Break down the scope into deliverables. Yes. Ah. Mm. Mm. No, the year and half, all these things, we will not think here. <laughs> we will not think about timing in this year. We only think about from this scope of work, what deliverables we need to produce. So the stakeholders review is going to happen. So it's not that you are developing a huh? WBS. You are using the stakeholders and the team members to read the scope of work and break down into deliverables. You are only guiding them. So you as a project manager leading this effort, doing all this for yourself alone. No. You are a leader for the project. You know what to do. You know what techniques to use. What is the best techniques you can use in achieving the effective plans? That's all your duty. So you are leading and directing this effort. Okay. So when we look at the deliverables, we are reviewing with the stakeholders. Ah, these are the deliverables you're expecting in this project. This is I could able to break down from the scope of work, which we finalize with you. They say, yeah, these are the deliverables we need. Sometimes they may say, Oh, something wrong here. Some of the deliverable I require is missing here. They will tell you. Oh, some of the deliverable is missing here. Look at it. Then when we go through the scope of work, there's no description about the deliverable he's looking for. So it means to miss the scope of work. So even we can able to identify the missing scope of work while you are creating the WBS. We say fill the cracks. So the WBS review will help in filling the cracks in scope of work. So we can able to refine the scope of work and add the deliverable. So the stakeholders are confirming, yes, these are the deliverable. That's good. The rule is like this. Any deliverable not in the WBS, it is not part of the project. That's all. Contract? Yeah. Baseline, not now. This is only initial step. Of it. The scope of work. Scope of work, the detailed description is there. They know what they want. So they can sign up. Huh? <coughs> scope of work, you mean project scope statement. Project scope statement. Hmm. Yes? So what they did, it, they gave you the detailed requirements. You went through with them, you reviewed with them, okay. Now you take these requirements, you describe the project work in a integrated manner, including the requirements and the methodology technology we are going to use in producing their product. That is the scope of work. When they review through this, they can able to say, yes, these are the deliverables we want, these are the scope of work, we agree. This is what we want, they will confirm. And then we break down the scope into deliverables. When we do the deliverables breakdown, they may see, oh, I have this deliverable, but before this deliverable, I should get this deliverable. Wow. They can able to see that something wrong in our scope of work. So we go back and refine. That all will happen. So we refine. Of course, if there is something missing, we need to look at it each step. Even, it's not, even though it's signed up, the signed up is the commitment for them. Yes, this is what we expect. So that when we create the plans, we will be able to meet it. And that's why we are getting that sign up to say, yes, this is what one. Otherwise, they will do, they will, this month they will say this. Next month they will say, no, no, I don't want this. Give me this another one. They keep changing their mind. That's why I say, yes, confirm this is what we want. So we are reviewing with them. Conducting the workshop, multiple workshops, and then we agree. Yes, this is the scope of work we expect. 
clear that's called wbs our biggest difficulty is we are not able to understand the project <laughs> if you don't understand the project everything is difficult if you understand the project everything become easier so the wbs helps us in understanding the entire project by visualizing the deliverables which you are going to produce from this scope of work also the team gets understanding better that the team is the one going to develop the plans so they must understand the project so each step of the planning work basically we are trying to achieve team is getting better understanding better understanding okay next what is the next okay we finish with the scope management planning <clears throat> the next process is schedule management Mm. No, all together, including strategy development, with scope management, plan scope management, your strategy development. No, no, no. In the plan scope management, you are producing scope management plan, which defines your strategy. You are only documenting. What is your strategy? What is your approach? What techniques you use? What is the result of each process? That's what you are documenting. It's only a strategy document. But all the four have a results. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so like, yeah. so of course, yeah. this is the basis for us to develop the time management work. We are thinking of how we are going to achieve these deliverable in the next step. When you develop the schedule, first you double develop BS. And then you do. No, different. Different. Schedule is different. Schedule is detailed. Hmm. When you are developing the schedule, you are developing WBS, right? That WBS is this is the WBS. That's the same thing. Just later, later when we develop the schedule, we may say this package will take from this, this period to this period. This package will take this period to this period. We can document later that after development of schedule. Same thing. Same thing. <clears throat> Your planner involves in the WBS development after he gets contract award, right? And then he study the scope of work, he comes up with the WBS. And then he determine the activities, determine the duration, determine the resources, and then he developing the schedule. But of course, you are all the engineers is going to be involved in this exercise. He is not going to decide himself alone, right? He is a tool for us. He know what to do, how to develop this project. But the information who is going to provide, you are the one going to provide. That's all part of this process. Next process. The next is plan schedule management. What is the result of this process? You know now. What is the result? Schedule management plan. <laughs> schedule management plan. What is schedule management plan? We are thinking about what is our strategy and approach in managing the timeline of the project. Where we are thinking about first part planning work. How are you going to develop the schedule? In order to develop the schedule, what we need to do? We need to determine activities. So how are you going to define the activities? What are all the tools and techniques you may use? How are you going to come up with a sequencing of project activities? What are all the tools and techniques you may use? How are you going to estimate the duration required for each activity? What are all the tools and techniques you may use? How are you going to develop the schedule? What are all the tools and techniques you may use? There are a lot of techniques 
available for developing the schedule, like schedule network analysis, critical path method, critical chain method, crashing, fast tracking, resource leveling, resource smoothing, Monte Carlo simulation, what if scenario analysis, there are multi techniques available. You may use all of these techniques, you may use combination of these techniques to come up with your schedule. So you need to think and document in the plan schedule management function. Then next stage we will think about next control schedule. What is my control schedule? So during execution, we need to measure our schedule performance periodically. Right. Whether the schedule performance is going to be measured weekly or biweekly or monthly. So when you are measuring the actual performance, you are going to compare with your schedule baseline to see whether we are aligned with the baseline or there are variances from the baseline. If there are variances, it could be a get up schedule, it could be a began schedule. A get up schedule, no problem. You are aligned with the baseline, no problem. You are on schedule. But when you are began schedule, you must understand how much we are began schedule. What is the magnitude of variance, right? Then accordingly, we need to come up with a necessary corrective action to improve the schedule performance. So how are we going to do that? What are the tools and techniques we may use? That's the next level of thinking. Hmm? Just strategy development. Keep it simple, man. Strategy and approach development. So we don't want you to jump into action straight away into the process. We want you to think, strategize, think how we are going to do this process, what are the tools and techniques we are going to use, think, document it, and then use that strategy in performing the processes so that we can be able to flow through the processes smoothly. That's what we are trying to ask you to do that. That's why they created this kind of processes. Clear? The next step is define activities. What are my define activities? Mm. 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 So basically in the WPS, what you did? You break down the scope into deliverables from higher order until the smallest size, which is work package. So what should be our next level of thinking? How are you going to create this work package? Work package is deliverable or could be multi-deliverable, right? So how are you going to create these deliverables? What are the actions and activities you need to perform in producing these deliverables? That's all the defined activities. So you're listing out what are the activities you need to perform in producing this deliverable. You're listing out activity, which is activity list is the result of this process. Activity list. The second result from this process is activity attributes. Activity attributes. What do you mean attributes? Attributes mean characteristics of the activity. Characteristic meaning, for example, one of the deliverable I put excavation. That's activity I put. Excavation means digging in the ground. Maybe you are not from that uh, industry. Okay, <laughs> digging the ground for foundation. Okay, and I say excavation. But I didn't describe anything more than that. Just say excavation. How will you estimate the resources required for this? How will you estimate the equipment required for this? How will you estimate the duration estimate for this? You must understand what is the characteristics of excavation. The excavation could be in sandy soil. It could be hard soil, it could be rocky soil, it could be loose soil, it could be clay soil. You must define the characteristics of the activity. Then only we can be able to determine the resources, determine the duration easily by understanding the characteristics. Right? That's called activity attributes. There are many items can be added later when you are doing the planning, predecessor, successor, assumption, constraints. All these can be added in the activity attributes. So you are listing out what all the activities to be performed. Say you are listing out one of the deliverable, 20 activities to be performed in order to produce this data. So what is 
So are you going to do all these 20 activities same time? Is it logical? That's what the next thing, activity sequence. Where you are thinking about what is the logical way of doing these activities in order to produce this deliverable. <coughs> so you are analyzing the dependency between the activities in order to come up with a appropriate sequence to perform these activities to produce the deliverables. That's called sequencing of project activities. The result of that process is project schedule network diagram. Project schedule network diagram, or simply you can say network diagram. The network diagram will show you <clears throat> from the start of the project until end of the project in what sequence the project activities need to be carried out in producing the project deliverables. Now, compared to the WBS, now by looking at the network diagram, team is getting better understanding. Uh, in the WBS, they can only see what deliverables we are going to produce. Here, they can see what activities they need to perform, in what specific sequence they need to perform in producing the deliverables. See, every step of planning work, they're getting better understanding. That's what we are trying to achieve. The next is estimate activity duration. So next, we need to determine how long each activity is going to take. How long each activity is going to take. How will you determine? Based on the nature of activity, likely dependencies between the activities will be considered. <clears throat> Resource, uh, what is the quantity of resources you are going to apply and the skill level of the resources you are going to apply. For example, I want to paint this building. If I put 20 workers, they may take one month to do the painting. If I put 40 workers, they may finish it 15 days. That too depends on the skill level of the painter. If I put all unskilled painter, they may even take two months. So you need to determine the duration of the activity by considering the quantity of resources you apply and the skill level of the resources you apply. When I say resources, it's not only manpower. That's my explanation I'm saying, including material, equipment, all. Then we are determining how long each activity is going to take. So your result is activity duration estimate. Activity duration estimate. The next step is develop schedule. What do you develop schedule? I know what all the activities to be carried out. What sequence needs to be carried out? In what the duration required for each activities? I know everything. So what do you want to do in the schedule? Hmm? It shows the days. Okay. Duration of the project. You know, they have 20 activities. Say each activity take 10 days. What is the duration of the project? 20 into 10, 200 days? No. Duration of the project is not the sum of the duration of all the activities. We need to put this duration into the calendar analog, and determine what is the shortest time period we could complete the project. Schedule down. We are determining the project duration by analyzing the duration. When they are determining the duration, do they think that when this activity is going to happen? No. They only know the nature of the activity, likely dependencies between the activities, resources required, and then they determine the duration. Right? But if they don't know <laughs> this activity is going to happen. Now in the schedule development, we know which period this activity is going to happen. So when we develop the schedule, again, we give a chance for the team to review the schedule and approve. Why? During the estimation of duration, they don't know when, which period this activity is going to happen. For example, some of the activity fall during the Ramadan period. <laughs> during Ramadan period, our working hours are less, our productivity also low. In this case, they may say, sir, 
this activity is estimated one month this is false during the ramadan period we may not able to achieve this we need to increase another 15 days for this activity they look at the other activity so this is coming during peak summer this period productivity will be better even better than our planned rate very peace climate in this period so you will be able to even reduce 15 days too. they can able to see that's why we are saying after development of the schedule we are asking them to review and approve to see the feasibility of achieving the estimated duration here we are going to learn a lot of techniques here <clears throat> mm. of course yes. No, I uh, may not be at this stage. <clears throat> Based on the level of information available about scope, the resources, and the duration, at this stage of assumption, whatever we know, we are coming up with a schedule, which is not final. It is initial schedule only. Yeah. Say revision zero. <laughs> then we still have a lot of planning work to do. It's not for end of the story. We are just reaching only middle way, right? You still have a planning work to do. After you deciding the procurement strategies, and then we will come back here again to revise the skill. It's not fun. We may go multiple revisions. <clears throat> It's only the first level, first revision of schedule. Consider that thing. Without these informations, you cannot even develop the plan, uh, procurement plan. You can only develop the procurement strategy only upon understanding the risk. Uh, you must follow these steps. That's why I told you planning processes are performed in this sequence only. This is the best possible sequence. Here, slight jumps can be done. For example, when you complete your defined activities and uh, uh, you can be able to send this information to the resource management area, estimate activity resources. <laughs> they can start estimating the resources and then they give feedback to the estimation cost process. See, estimation of duration process. And they use this information to estimate the duration. They come up with their first revision of schedule. We present to the stakeholder. We get their feedback. Then we continue our planning efforts. When we reach to the risk management, I'm going to analyze, identify all the risks. I come up with the action plan. Based on the action plan, I decide the procurement strategy. And then I take the information from the procurement strategy. I come back to the schedule again. I will include when the tender need to be called for. How long is the tender response period? How long we will take for tender review? When we will go for negotiation? When we award the contract? All this can be plugged in later. <clears throat> correct, correct. <laughs> Clear? Here. We are going to learn a lot of techniques. Schedule network analysis, critical path method, schedule compression techniques like crashing, fast tracking, resource leveling, resource smoothing, what if scenario analysis, uh, Monte Carlo simulation, all these techniques we need to learn. Now, at the next step. When I discuss here, then uh, you will never finish. <laughs> That we will talk about tools and technique and just giving you the understanding to make yourself aware how it is happening. Yeah. Mm. But it's not going to be happen in the first step when you develop the schedule, it's going to be schedule based plan. You still have a lot of work to do. And then we come back, revise. You may go for multiple revisions. Then finally, when I reach to say revision four, all the stakeholders say this schedule is perfect. Then we will become baseline. So it's not first. Okay, let's take a break and then we'll talk about other processes.
Okay, let's start. So let's go to the next process. Let's take the cost management area now. We have three processes in the planning. First process is plan cost management. What is the result of this process? Cost management plan. So here we are thinking about how are we going to manage the cost of the project throughout the project life cycle. What is our strategy and approach in managing the cost of the project? Where you are thinking about how are we going to determine the estimate the cost of the project? How are you going to determine the budget? So in order to explain that, I will go to the board so that you will have a wider understanding of cost and budgeting process. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Okay. What we did in the WBS process, we break down the scope of work into deliverables, right? What is the lowest level of the WPS? Work package. Assuming this project has four work packages now. Say package one, package two, package three, package four. When I come to the estimation of the cost, I need to estimate the cost of the each work package add up together, I get the cost of the project. What do you mean by cost of the work package? Cost of what? Cost of the materials, equipments, human resources, right? So basically, cost estimation is nothing but approximate cost of the resources required for carrying out the project work. So in order to do the cost estimation for the package, what you did next step? You break down this package into activities, right? Define activities process. So activity one, activity two, activity three, and so on. You break down. Now I need to estimate the cost of each activity. Add up together, I get the cost of the package, correct? How can I determine the cost of the each activity? Each activity, unskilled labor, how much? Skilled labor, materials, equipments, quality effort, project management effort, all these resource requirements are estimated for each activity, each resource. Add up together, I get the activity cost. Now add up all the activity costs, I get the package cost. Now add up all the package costs, I get the cost of the project. This is called cost estimation process. This is called cost estimation process. All are, all are being estimated, appropriate, whatever it is, all are being estimated with this estimation. But when you are talking about you as a contractor, you may be doing all these things. But when I do as a project manager, I do the high level estimation. I will not do the detailed estimation. If I have the cost consultant, they may have more level of detail, which is generally budgetary estimate. We'll talk about that estimate, the different estimates and the accuracy of estimates later. Understand the concept first. Now, I'm getting the cost of the project as 300 million now. 300 million. When I complete this cost estimation process, I'm getting the 
cost of the project is 300 million. Can I move to execution or anything to be added? Hmm? Design cost. Okay. You, may, you already have this. Design cost, other uh, consultancy cost, all you can add it. Huh? No, that's that's the budget. So what is the meaning of huh? management cost? What do you mean management cost? Overhead, salaries, management, all this you are estimating within this, no problem. So when I complete the cost estimation, can I move to execution? So what I do, what I need to add for that? Procurement has to be issued approval. So we're waiting for procurement only. No. When we are doing this estimation, what we are doing? We are assuming what revision of scope of work we use for this estimation, what all the assumptions related to the estimation, what all the situations we consider in doing this estimation, sometimes market fluctuations are there. Where are you getting the resources? Are you getting the resources locally, different rate? Regionally different rate, internationally different rate, all this being you assume, and then you're coming up with the estimate. Do you think all your assumptions are going to happen as it is while you are doing execution? No. So you may face certain risk during the project life cycle or uncertainties. What will happen when there is uncertainties during the price cycle of the project? You may end up in spending more money. You ended up spending more time. Where is the money to go to come from to deal with this kind of uncertainties during the life cycle? So that has to be calculated. So what we need to do now, upon completion of the estimation, we need to go back to the risk management area. Yeah. Legal team? No. Legal, legal team is not involved here. It's all part of our techniques only. So we are going to the reviewing all of our plans to identify the what are the various risks in this project. Say so when you're doing this exercise, you have the processes in the planning. Risk management. I, I will show you. There are processes. Uh, Only commercial team? No, the entire project team involved. It needs only not only commercial expertise. It also need technical risk is there, project management risk is there, commercial risk is there, external risk there, internal risk, organization risk is there. So there are many risks, many sorts of risk. Yes, a project manager has to coordinate this. He is the one owner of this risk register. Not risk factor. You are identifying a risk, analyzing the risk to understand what is this risk, what kind of impact it creates, what is the strategy we can use in eliminating the risk from the project or reducing the negative consequences on the project. So assuming we are going through the risk management processes, we have the identify risk, perform qualitative analysis, perform quantitative risk analysis, plan risk response, and so on. We go through this process. So assuming I have identified 20 risks in the project. I identified 20 risks in the project. I'm going through these processes. I'm trying to understand the risk better in order to understand what is the impact it could create. <coughs> and what is our action plan in responding to the risk when it happens? So you are coming up with this strategy. Say, when I do this exercise, I'm able to come up with a risk response action plan for 15 risks. Using the risk response action plan, I revise my plan in order to eliminate the risk from the project. But still, there are five risks still remaining with me. Still, there are five risks remaining with me. I could not be able to come up with any workable action plan. I could not be able to come up with any workable action plan. So what can I do with this risk? Because I don't know the plan. Can I ignore them? So we need to add 
additional time and cost to the project plans in order to deal with the remaining risk. We know the risk, but we don't have the action plan. That's our situation, right? We know the risk, we don't have the action plan. Hmm. Hmm. High level risk is there. Uh, ah, okay, expectation. That's only expectation. But when we make the schedule, hmm. we need more than that. Hmm. We need to find a way. Also possible. We will provide us with the risk area. Why you are adding costs? You are reducing the timeline. So it may end up in. Hmm. Or we may re-estimate to come up with the reverse cost. Hmm. So here I am adding additional cost or time to deal with the risk which are known to us, but we do not have any action plan. This additional time and cost is called as contingency reserve. But contingency reserve. So we are adding contingency reserve with the cost estimation. Contingency result. Say I'm adding another 30 million as a contingency result. What's my total now? 330 million. 330 million. This 330 million is called as cost baseline. Cost baseline. Hmm. It's a percentage. Or we have formulas to calculate in the risk management area under quantitative risk analysis, and able to determine how much contingency we need to allocate is there. <clears throat> we can determine that. So 330 million is the cost. What does that mean? We are agreeing with the stakeholders in the planning that we will be able to finish the project in 330 million. 330 million. That's our commitment to the stakeholders. That's called the cost baseline. So while you are executing the work, you are managing the cost baseline to see whether we are working or spending the money aligned with the budget in order to meet the cost baseline and complete the project within the agreed budget. That's our management effort in the execution stage under cost control exercise. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. After assessing the risk, yes. When the risk happens, you may spend. When the risk doesn't happen, it is a profit for you. That's all. The, stall, the money is with you. Yes, some cases we use percentage, but in the risk management area, we have the uh, calculation can be done to determine the contingency reserve for each risk. Because there are two cases there. For example, here I'm explaining only one case where I don't have the action plan, I'm adding certain percentage of cost or time as a contingency reserve. There are other cases. I know the risk. I have the action plan. Say, for example, one of the risks is going to create six month time impact, 10 million cost impact. I determined that. I come up with the action plan. What is my action plan? I want to appoint a third party contractor to do this package. Thereby, we can reduce the risk. But he cannot eliminate the total risk, but he can reduce the negative impact. Instead of six month delay, he may reduce down to one month. Instead of 10 million cost impact we expected, he may reduce down to one million. Still, we may face one month time impact, one month cost impact, even with the adoption of the strategic plan. Then it will be calculated as a contingency resource. The two cases are there. That we will do in the risk money. So basically, we cannot finalize the budget without 
interacting with the risk management. Only upon completion of the risk management processes, we will come back to this process. We establish the cost baseline. Okay. So there's a two-step action is there. It is not that even though the process is mentioned there, we cannot determine budget now until you complete the risk management processes. Okay. Keep that in mind. Now, this is I'm talking about the contingency reserve is for foreseeable risk. What is that? Foreseeable risk. Foreseeable risk. Meaning I could foresee this risk from my plans. Right? Then you are adding. But there are possible unforeseen risk you may face. There are possible unforeseen risk you may face. What is unforeseen risk? Baba. Baba. What is unforeseen risk? Huh? A natural disaster could be unforeseen risk. For example, the, uh, in our country, COVID, one of the example. Blockade happened three years ago, is one of the example, right? Did we expect the blockade? No. So, what happened when the blockade happened? All our projects stopped, all our supply chain affected, right? We ended up in delay. What we did? We went to the other regions. We bring the material equipment. We did air freight. We did take the longer shipping route. <coughs> we ended up spending more money. Where is the money going to come from to deal with this kind of situation? If you don't allocate here. So we are adding additional time or cost in order to deal with the unforeseen risk. They are called as management reserve. What they are called as <coughs> management reserve. Management reserve. What is management reserve? It is for dealing with the unforeseen risks. So I'm adding another 20 million as a management reserve. A total now 350 million. This is called cost budget or project budget. So when I say cost budget, which means estimated cost of the project plus contingency reserve, plus management reserve. Or in other words, cost baseline plus management reserve will give you the cost budget. So when there is any unforeseen risk happens, you can use this money. But this money is not with you. This money with the sponsor or management. Only when there is unforeseen risk happen, you are going to draw the fund from them and manage it. Maybe in the contracts, maybe you see one class, force majeure, right? That is for dealing with the unforeseen risk. Force majeure. That is the for dealing with the unforeseen risk. No, no, that is good. That is good. That is good. <clears throat> Detention money is the amount you are holding it until he completes the deliverables. That is part of this, this amount itself. This amount. Because you agreed 300 million contract, you signed the agreement. So 10% you are keeping retention. When he completes the deliverable, handed over, you return 5%. After he come, finishes maintenance period, you return another 5%. This is for managing the performance. That's the way the contract is set up. So, 
when i say cost budget that means estimated cost plus contingency reserve plus management cost when i say cost baseline it only contains estimated cost plus management contingency reserve that's it. that means you are committing to the stakeholders by end of the planning that you will finish the project in 330 million 330 million this is one function of the budgeting process what is the second function now you establish cost base line of 330 million now the stakeholders must give you the sponsor must give you 330 million check all the project manager take this 330 million check go and do the project theoretically speaking that's what we agreed i will finish the project in 330 million right are they going to give you 330 million check what they will ask you ha huh? to link with that deliver report basically they will ask you how are you going to spend this 330 million over the life cycle of the project the three years project how are you going to spend this how much you need on the first quarter how much you need on second quarter how much you need on third quarter you must tell them right that is the second function of the budgeting process so you are coming to fund the requirement how will you do that so i take this 330 million cost base line and go and distribute to these packages package 100 million package 200 million package 300 million package 430 million so i can come up with a flow now funding flow how we can come up with i put a curve this is cost this is timeline first quarter how much you need second quarter how much you need third quarter how much you know in the first quarter what are all the deliverables we are going to produce we know what is the budgeted cost for those deliverables we know so we can determine how much we need for the first quarter so i can come up with a curve like this this is called yes curve what is this called yes curve like this one why it is going to come down so that means they are going to reduce the funding for you no <laughs> you are only going to show how you are going to use your 330 million over the life cycle of the project right so that the stakeholders will be prepared with the money are they going to keep on 330 million from the day one no they also need to prepare the funding right so they must know how we are going to spend this so they will be preparing accordingly that's called budgeting process clear now so what's the key point you must remember when i start i am establishing the cost baseline in the determined budget process only upon completion of the risk management processes without completion of the risk management processes we cannot complete the budgeting process so we are establishing the cost base line and then we are establishing the project funding requirements to show them how we are going to spend this cost base line amount over the life cycle of the project this is called budgeting process so assuming we have done all other planning work we finalize the plan now move to the execution you are executing the work you are spending the money so what we need to do in this stage we need to measure our performance in achieving the completion of the project work align with our budget so we need to measure our performance periodically it could be weekly measurement biweekly measurement monthly measurement so you need to measure your cost performance and then you compare with your cost baseline to see whether you are aligned with the budget in order to do that we need to understand the end value technique that is the cost control commonly used technique <clears throat> what happens is when you are executing the work many people they do like this 
they look at the schedule. They look at the schedule. They look at the planned activities duration. They look at the actual activity duration, the consume. Plan versus actual duration matches. They are assuming we are on schedule. We are on budget. We completed all the work. This is what they are assuming. It may not be true. Yes, you achieved the actual completion of the activity according to the planned duration. But maybe you are spending more resources in achieving the. Maybe you are spending more money. How can you see that by simply comparing plan versus actual duration? If you really need to understand the performance, you must question yourself. What is the scope you agreed to deliver until today? What is the timeline we agreed to deliver? What is the budget we agreed to deliver? What we have accomplished, what we have completed until today? What we spent until today? All has to be analyzed together. Then only you will be able to get the realistic performance measurement. So, and based on that, if the performance is not matching with our plan, then we can take necessary corrective action to improve the performance so that we will be able to achieve the project completion within the agreed budget of 330 million cost baseline. This is what we are doing through the control cost process. <clears throat> Let me explain. I will take on the photo for this, or if it is in your mind now. Clear? If you want, I can take photo and put it there. So we can keep it. Now let's go and understand the cost control. The principle only, of course, we will do a lot of exercises during the, that process. So we have finalized the budget now, we move to the execution. So we are going to use end value technique to determine the performance. End value technique or end value management. What I said, it is a integration of scope, time, and cost information to determine the performance. In order to explain this technique, I will make a small sketch. Assuming this line, I call it as a plan line. I call this line as a actual line. I call this line as a forecast line. I will tell you what is forecast. What is my budget? 330 million. That's my budget, right? That's what I agreed cost based, right? 330 million. We will complete the project in 330 million. We agreed. Now I am executing the work. Today I am measuring the progress. Today I am measuring the progress. So what we need to analyze now? According to the schedule, how many number of deliverables we plan to complete until today? What is our plan? When you look at the schedule, you know what are the deliverables you need to complete. So assuming we need to complete 20 deliverables according to the schedule. From start until now, we are supposed to complete 20 deliverables according to the schedule. But you know what is the budget for each deliverable? You already assigned. So we can determine the cost. That cost is called as PV. What is that? PV, planned value. Planned value. What is planned value? Budgeted cost of the work you plan to complete until today. Budgeted cost of the work you plan to complete until today. That is called planned value. Then, okay, good. I planned for 20 deliverables. 
what I have completed. What is my actual accomplishment? When I look at it, I have completed so far 15 deliverables. I have completed so far 15 deliverables. That's my actual accomplishment currently. So what is the budgeted cost for that 15 deliverables? Which is called earned value. What is that called? Earned value. What is earned value? Budgeted cost of the work you have completed until today. Or budgeted cost of the work you have accomplished as of now, right? Which is nothing but value of work done. That's what you are assessing, right? Value of work done, which is end value. The next question comes, okay, I completed 15 deliverables. But what is the actual cost of spending in completing these 15 deliverables? What's the actual cost? Where can I get this information? I go to the financial people. They will tell me how much we spent on unskilled labor, how much spent on skilled labor, how much spent on equipment, how much spent on, uh, say, materials, how much spent on overhead, how much spent on other expenses. So he will tell you, this is the amount we spent actually until now, which is called actual cost. What is it called? Actual cost. Do I anybody have a doubt on this three? If you don't have a doubt on this three, the entire principle is uh, become easier. Yeah. End value. End value is you are analyzing how many number of deliverable I have completed until today. That's my actual achievement. So you are determining what is the budgeted cost for those deliverables I have completed until now. That is called end value. Budgeted cost of the work or deliverables you have completed until today, which is value of work done. Yeah. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. will be equal to the plan value. But not necessarily you are going on schedule doesn't mean that you are going on budget also. <laughs> maybe as you are on schedule, maybe you are spending more money. That we will determine here, don't worry. <laughs> we will determine here. <coughs> now, after understanding the performance formula, you tell me what do you want. <laughs> so with these three value, we can determine four progress measurements. One, schedule variance, SV, cost variance, CV, schedule performance index, SPI, cost performance index, CPI. <laughs> These are the four progress measurements we can determine to understand the performance. Very simple formula. Schedule variance means EV minus PV. End value minus plant value. <coughs> Cost variance means EV minus AC. <coughs> SPI. EV divided by PV. CPI. EV divided by AC. That's all. Actual cost is the amount we spent until today. Actual amount. We have same as end value. No, this is budgeted cost. Budgeted cost of the deliverable you have completed until today. It is not the actual cost. Value of work done. Value means what? But ah, cost of the work done. Budgeted cost of the work done. That's the value of work done. <coughs> Yeah. Schedule performance index. CPI cost performance index. <laughs> so actually, mm. how much money you spend for doing that? 
in completing these deliverables. Actual cost means until now we finished 15 deliverable, this much amount we spent. <coughs> Correct. Now let's analyze these formulas. Okay. Let me repeat again. Okay. Listen carefully. So when I am analyzing, what I am analyzing? What are all the deliverable I need to complete until today according to my plan or according to my schedule? Right. So I determine. I have to complete 20 deliverables according to my schedule until today. What is the budget or cost for those 20 deliverables? You know, each deliverable, how much is the cost? You already allocated, right? So that amount is the planned value. That's why I said budget or cost of the work you plan to complete until today. When I say end value, you are analyzing what we have achieved, what all the deliverables we have completed. What is the budgeted cost for those deliverables? Which is the end value? Budgeted cost of the work, you are complete until today. Are the deliverables, you are complete until today. It's the budget of both are budgeted cost. Whereas this one based on actual accomplishment. This one based on our plan. That's it. Actual cost, you know, which we can get it from accountants. <clears throat> Plan value and value should be same for that means you are schedule, our schedule. That's what we are going to do now. One, if SV shows positive, that means you are again up schedule. When schedule variance shows negative, you are behind schedule. That's what your indication. When cost variance shows positive, you are under budget. What do you mean by under budget? No money to spend. Many people say well, under budget, no money to spend, sir. No. You are spending less than the budgeted amount. That's what the meaning of under budget. When CV shows negative, you are over budget, meaning you are spending more than the budgeted amount. SPI equal to one, you are on schedule. If less than one, you are behind schedule. Greater than one, you are again up schedule. If CPI equal to one, you are on budget. Means you are spending as per the budget. Less than one, you are over budget. Greater than one, you are under budget. So with this four progress measurement, we can understand where are we now with respect to this schedule and cost. How we determine that? By considering the scope we supposed to deliver. So we consider scope time cost. <clears throat> this is the cost control exercise. Suppose now you are behind schedule, over budget. How much you over budget? You can see from CV. CV indicates how much you are over budget. It says 10 million CV, 10 million. That means we are 10 million over budget currently, minus 10 million over budget. <coughs> we are beyond schedule. So what we need to do now? Can we leave it like this? Continue the project? No. So we need to come up with a corrective action by understanding the reason behind this variance and then propose an SI corrective action to improve the cost performance, schedule performance. <coughs> that is one action. Second action, forecast. What do you mean forecast? Hmm? Decrease the cost later on. Okay, no. 
Say currently, what is my performance? I am 10 million over budget. I am currently 10 million over budget. <clears throat> Assuming you are continuing the project work without any taxing actions, you are continuing the same kind of performance throughout the cycle. In a situation of schedule over budget situation, you continue. Do you think you will be able to finish the project in 330 million? Even at this stage, you are 10 million. So I can forecast based on my current performance, what will be the project budget at completion, which is called EAC. What is EAC? Estimate at completion. Estimate at completion, which is called forecasting. So I can forecast how much the project will cost at completion. When I do that exercise, I'm getting the value, say, 350 million. This is what I'm forecasting based on my current performance. What does that mean? That means you are telling the stakeholders the project will cost 350 million. So what is the variance you are expecting at completion, which is called VAC, variance at completion. What is that called? Variance at completion. So what your original budget? 350. Based on your current performance, what you are forecasting? 350. So what is the variance you are expecting? You are expecting 20 million more negative variance. Meaning, you are telling the stakeholders, guys, based on our current performance, you need to come up with a 20 million from your pocket to finish the project. That's what you are telling them, right? What they will say? No problem. Tomorrow, 20 million. Right? Who, who, anybody got it? They will say, no. This is not acceptable. You are committed that you will finish the project in 330 million. So you need to take action to improve the performance and make sure you are completing the project in 330 million. That's what they will tell you. <coughs> this is one forecast value. Second forecast value. Say, for example, I spent 80 million until now, say, actual cost. I spent 80 million. At this stage, my cost variance is 10 million negative. If I continue this performance, do you think that I will complete the project within the remaining budget? How much I have? 330 minus 80 I spent already. So 250 only I have in my hand to complete the remaining portion of the project. Do you think I will finish the project in 250 million if I continue like this kind of performance? No. So I can forecast how much the remaining project work will cost you based on our current performance, which is called ETC. What is that called? ETC, which is also forecast value. ETC means estimate to complete. Estimate to complete. <clears throat> so EAC and ETC are forecast values. Huh? Formula, you mean? ETC? Okay. You want me to explain again? Okay. So far, my actual spending is 80 million. My current cost performance is 10 million over budget. I spent 10 million more than the budget amount currently. So what's my remaining budget? 330 is the agreed budget. 80 I spent so far. So I have remaining 250 million. So if I go like this kind of performance, do you think the remaining work will finish in 250 million? No, it will cost you more. So I can estimate how much the remaining work will cost you, which is basically simple. My forecast value is 330 minus 80 million actual money I spent. The remaining is the ETC value. That's all. So ETC is nothing but EAC minus EAC. EAC minus EAC. But to determine the for EAC value, there are four situations and four formulas. I will explain later when I go into that process. <clears throat> Understand the principle. 
And now we are saying how much variance? We are expecting 20 million variance at completion based on our current performance. What are reporting to the stakeholders? Stakeholders, sorry, sorry, no, this is too much impact. We are, cannot be able to withstand this kind of variances. It's not acceptable. We need to come up with a necessary corrective action to improve the performance in order to complete the project within the agreed budget of 330 million. Correct? This is what they will tell you. Okay, everybody understand why we are in this situation. Our current productivity rate achieved is not sufficient to complete the work within the budget. So what we need to do? We need to increase our productivity so that we can improve our performance. Right? So how much we need to increase? 10% increase, okay. 20% increase, okay. 30% increase, okay. We can determine, which is called two complete performance index, TCPI. What is it called? Two complete performance index, which is nothing but <coughs> BAC minus EV divided by BAC minus AC. BAC minus EV gives you what is the work remaining in my hand. BAC minus AAC give you what is the money remaining in my hand. Work remaining in my hand divided by money remaining in my hand will give you the two complete performance index. Say, for example, when I do the calculation, I'm getting value 1.25. What does that mean? That means you need to increase your productivity by another 25% in order to complete the project in. 330 million. Otherwise, you have to come up with your 20 million from your pocket to finish the project. That's what the meaning. If it is less than one, we are doing good. Greater than one, we are doing bad. When the TCPA value is greater than one, say if it's 1.4, means you may to increase your productivity by another 40% for the remaining work completion. Not here. For the remaining work. So that we will be able to achieve the project work within the 330 million. This is called cost control. So we periodically do this exercise and take action for improving the performance so that we will be able to achieve the project work within the agreed budget of 330 million. This is called control cost. Yes. Mm. You hear? No, budget at completion, at completion. This is agreed budget. TCPA means two complete performance index. What does that mean? What we told them here when we determined the VAC, what the variance we are expecting? 20 million more than the budgeted amount. This is the variance. Now the stakeholders say, no, this performance is not acceptable. So you need to take action to improve the performance. When we analyze, we find out, for example, current productivity is poor. It's not matching with our plan. That's why we are in the over budget. If you are productivity according to the plan, you should be achieving as per the budget. Right? So your current productivity is low. So we need to increase the productivity in order to improve the performance. <laughs> Meaning the resources need to be used efficiently to achieve the project work. That's what it means, right? So the next question comes to you. Okay, you are telling me productivity need to be increased. How much? 5%, 10%, 20%. That's why we are doing this calculation. So it gives you the idea how much percentage productivity need to be improved. Clear? That's all. Hmm. This is all budgeted parameters. This is based on the plan. This is based on actual accomplishment of deliverables. This is actual work completed based on budget. That's why I told you here example what I said. I planned 20 deliverables. 
So my plant value is 20 into budgeted cost of each deliverable. That is the plant value. Here, what I achieved? 15 only. So I am estimating what is the end value for the work completed. <clears throat> when you say value of work done, what does that mean? Value of work done. Budgeted cost. Not the actual cost. Huh? Budgeted cost of the work you have completed until now. Mm. Based on the plan. I give you a simple trick to memorize this formula in your mind. <laughs> if I anything I talk about related to the schedule performance, your mind must go to PV. If I talk about cost performance, you might go to AC. When I say variance, which is nothing but end value minus something. When I say performance index, it's nothing but end value divided by something. Look at it. Schedule variance. Schedule means my might go to PV, EV minus PV. Cost variance, my might go to AC, EV minus AC. Schedule performance index, EV divided by something. Schedule means PV, EV divided by PV. Cost performance index, EV divided by cost means AC. So EV divided by AC. So it stays in your mind. Clear? As a principle, of course, when we do the calculation, when I do the examples, you will understand better. To complete performance index. In order to complete the project within the agreed budget, how much productivity we need to increase based on our current performance. Bad. It's bad for us. It is less than one, that means you are doing good. It may not be negative cost variance. It may be under budget. Mm. 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 Estimator, budgeted cost of the packages. Mm. You are you already budgeted 330 million for the project. You agreed. So your duty is to manage it. <laughs> ah. Ah. Doesn't matter. For me, you agreed 330 million. You distributed 330 million to the packages. Why? Did I make any change? If I make change, yes, I must give you additional time. I must give you additional cost. Whereas I didn't make change. You are the one performing. You agreed. You are the one performing. So you must take action. That's the one now. Okay. Determined budget process. That's the determined budget process. That's the baseline. Cost baseline is the one we are determining in the determined budget process. You no, you already estimated the cost for each package by considering the unskilled labor, skill labor, material, equipment, quality support, risk management effort, and so on, and then including profit, all these things. You may estimate it. Then you came up with the 300 million. Mm. Mm. Yeah, already you determine profit as part of this. If you are managing the risk very well, you are getting that 30 million as your profit. <laughs> it increases your profit. <laughs> right? No, I don't understand. Tell me, repeat. Mm. Mm. I will give. Uh, I will do that during the planning as a project manager. I work with the sponsor. I determine the risk. I analyze. I come up with the strategies. I come up with the estimate. I come up with the budget. So I came up with yes, say three hundred thirty million. 
when I complete my procurement planning, I decided to go for tender for certain item, proposal for certain item, and so on. I call for tender. Then seller submitted. I analyzed. Then I selected one sender. I negotiated the cost, negotiated the timeline. That time, I negotiated for 300 million. The final price is 300 million. I have what are my allegated my allegation is 330 million. So I can go back, adjust my budgeting process. I will reduce to 300 million. That is actual now. After the 10 days. Suppose the lowest tender is 350 million. In this case, my budget allegation is not enough. So I need to add another 20 million more into my budget. So I will propose to the sponsor to increase the budget to another 20 million. That's the way I need to handle. <clears throat> so when you are agreeing, as I say main contractor, when you're agreeing 330 million, that is your the cost baseline, which means which includes risk you could face in doing this project. <coughs> but if I don't calculate in my planning, I don't allocate the money. When you're asking 350 million, how I'm going to give you? That's why I'm estimating as part of the budget. So I have the money in my hand. Hmm. Hmm. That means you are paying the actual cost or you are going to pay based on the agreed price? The budget itself will change based on the progress? No. Why? So in this called is cost reimbursable contract. Cost plus, cost plus contract, you mean. Yes. That is, we are doing all the actual cost we are spending, but the profit, we agreed certain percentage. Yeah. And then say, finish 10, 50 million work, 10% uh, say fee for him, 10% of 50 million, we pay him. If we finish 100 million work, 100 million, we pay actual spending, plus 10% as a fee, we will pay. That's a cost reimbursable contract. That we will talk about in the kind of procurement area, various type of contract to utilize. Okay, this is good enough for the day. Perfect timing. We can close today. Let's meet on Wednesday. <clears throat>